Let me present the panelists and you can also present yourself. So first we have Daniel Vasquez. Well, Daniel Vasquez, uh, software engineer. I'm working now for, for Nestlé, the global hub here in Splugas. So I have been working 10 years in the industry, mostly, well, as a developer in, in many different stacks. So, uh, we, we started to use Cine Storming as a, as a tool for especially collaborating with uh, business. Then I go with different clients and different spaces, so this is what I would like to share today. Thank you. Next we have Angel. Hi, I'm also a software engineer. I have almost six years of experience in the industry, and I work also with several stacks like Java, .NET, C++, C, things like that. Uh, nowadays, I'm a team lead the backend part in Doctoralia, and we are applying even storming for our own system because we have our own product, and we are using that for the legacy parts, for the new parts, and I want to share what we learned and what we did. Maybe it's not the most pure approach to webbing storming, but it was quite interesting. Thank you very much. Then we have Enrique. Hi, I'm Enrique or Kike, if you make it easy. I'm Brazilian, so that's why my very shitty accent. The, I'm, I'm also a software developer. I work for ThoughtWorks for uh, eight years, eight uh, years and a half or so. I started there in Brazil, moved here to Barcelona, and <coughs> ThoughtWorks is a, like a consulting company, so like I've been working different clients as a developer um, for the past uh, eight years and a half. And actually, the first experience I have with Event Stormy uh, was with Danny. We were working together. So, yeah. thank you. And I will also join the panel discussion, and <coughs> I will try to moderate it. These are these are the dynamics, but we are not going to follow them strictly if we have mm, richness in the discussion. So basically, two rounds. In the first one, we can speak freely. Then we have the discussion, and then you can ask whatever you want. And this is the outline that we will follow. The aim is not to cover the whole thing, instead to follow and let it flow, and until the point we reach. So, well, I, I will start just explaining a little where does it come from and then we start the discussion. So, even storming comes from the DDD community. It's not a silver bullet. It has almost seven years of uh, of creation and it all started when Alberto Brandolini uh, developed a workshop called Event Based Modeling in 2012. Then, during the Von Vernon's Implementing Domain Driven Design workshop in Europe, he refines this workshop and then in 2013. He changed the name of this workshop to Even Storming, and then he wrote the first blog about it. And then in 2016, he published the first publication of the book. So, after having said that, we start the discussion, and this is the, the topics are open questions or statements. We will follow them as they are. So if you have preference to start, just raise your hand or take a start. <laughs> <laughs> I got voluntold. I will put right. you. Uh, just just out of curiosity from the people here who who ever heard about event storming? Yeah, and whoever uh, did a session participate in the session of event storm. Okay, 
Uh, yeah, so the, the idea, like Danny explained the idea, where it came from and whatnot, but I think the, one of the main goals, it's, it's a workshop that um, different from just getting people together and doing a random brainstorm into how can we fix a problem or how do we map uh, uh, the way our system works. It has some specific rules. We're going to talk about what are those rules. It has some like fans, commands and whatnot. And, but the main goal of it, it's basically to get get some clar clarification and alignment between the people in that room on how things are currently working. So the idea is to, one of the ideas, there are many use for it, but the idea is to <coughs> be able to uh, reflect how your your value stream uh, work, uh, like happens in your company, for example, in a specific flow, and then map that visually. So then we can start talking about and, and improve and different ways of doing um, yeah. yeah, so to, to continue the, the idea, I think that the, the main interesting thing about the storming is first of all, it's a visual thing. So when it's, it, it's a starting point to, to get to the proper discussions. So it's, a, uh, it's something that is actually promoting those discussions. So I think that there, there is where it resides the real value of the workshop itself. It's how we find the spots in which we want to talk about. So more than more than the shape itself or the, the outcome, then, then we will talk about the outcomes. It's it's something that uh, will give us this space, the shared space, for this. Why? Because the shared understanding is probably the, the, the more overlooked thing that we are uh, doing when, when we start the project or when we design something. Many times what we are trying to optimize is how we divide the task, how we start to work, how we, we, we go to the point versus the fact that we want to learn about things. So even storming is something that will help us to uh, drive the conversation for learning. This is, uh, I think, the, the, the most important thing about it. And the other stuff which is very important is the even storming is the workshop in which we try to put together those people who is able to answer questions and the people who need to do the questions in the same at the same time. So it's really cost effect effective, I would say, even if it's a expensive kind of workshop because you need a lot of people uh, devoting a lot of time at the same time. It's really optimized in terms of everybody is there, so you so you get to to a point in which you start to share things. So maybe I'm I'm going further in, in terms of I'm I'm doing some teasers in terms of what are the things that we are gonna find out, but as what it is. Uh, I, I see it only always from that point of view, beside of the, the shape itself of the formality. They forgot to say that even storming also is using tons of posits, tons of them. <laughs> yeah, it's not as effective in those terms. <laughs> and it's super useful for that, for allowing also people uh, from the business perspective, also developers or designers. Or you will be super surprised when you get to know some people and some business people sometimes were telling me, oh, I didn't know that the developers have all this knowledge of the product itself or the other way around. So it's, for me, it's the most important thing of doing storming. It's a, an activity to align a different kind of roles inside the team. I will keep it short and say that it's a tool, it's not the purpose, and let's let you model a complex business domain in an event fashion way fastly. Well, are you I fine? Say, yeah, yeah, it's a very good. It's, yeah, like some people could argue, like, why does a developer or a team of developers need to know this much about the business? Like, why? What's the point? It's a very basic question that some business people could ask. It's like, why do we have to bridge, right? This uh, developers knowing so much about the business if you are just making software. Yeah, if, you, if you allow me to to go to that point, it's, and it's actually really well explained in the book of Ivan Stormin or Brandolini. He, he explained it brilliantly. Probably I will not be able to explain it in that way, but this is a conversation that I have kind of every day in the company. Why you should 
do this why do we don't just use the, the bridges business analysts call it how you want the product owner itself so the thing is from my point of view is software as activity it's you can see it in two two ways it's something that you you need to type and this is what you want to optimize how fast you type things or how how fast you are going to learn about those, that business and we mostly know that there is this telephone problem every time that you try to um, expand general purpose tool or the, a tool that has different levels of detail and it's for technical people business people people involved in the specific uh, context of that business uh, operations people sales marketing uh, more um, general miscellaneous people for instance human resources people that has uh, onboarded the company now it's almost everyone that is interested in learning about the business. Next topic. Kind of coordinated. Well, I think that uh, classical one, the facilitator. I think that is quite important. Then we can further discuss if that facilitator needs to be a very technical, very, very trained people or not. Uh, and f what is mostly to, to summarize is someone who can ans answer and someone who can do the questions. So uh, if all the people who is there is going to just do the questions, uh, probably it's not going to be too useful. And, and the same the opposite, right? The, those who just have answers but have no technical idea about anything also will be probably futile. I think we agree it's the facilitator and the participants. Yeah. I would say <laughs> it depends because yeah. if it's a uh, startup, the startup in their initial months or years, perhaps all the people. Uh, are five, ten, so it's crucial that all of them are in the, in the workshop. If it's a corporate, medium, uh, and large sized, usually standard might be 20 up to 30, 35 with one facilitator, but if you have more people, you can scale the workshop but with more than 30-35, usually it requires, apart from more space, that might be the constraint. You also need another facilitator, so, so one is keeping track of the timeline and the other uh, to the people and politics, so it depends on the specific needs of that business. In my experience, I always did this with an amount of people, like between 10 and 18, more or less. But we were choosing the people depending on the context, and with that amount of people at least in our company was enough. Maybe in other cases, in bigger clients, if you are in a consultancy or something, you need more people. But I also agree that more than 30, for sure, is not impossible, but harder. You need a megaphone. Yeah, <laughs> and a very big, big, big room. Are there lots of groups talking at the same time and changing, changing the wall at the same time? Is that the way? Because I'm just trying to imagine 30 people. The, 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 that's the storming part of the. the yeah. uh, I, in my case, the, the, the most I had in the one session was around 20, more or less, and usually around 8, 10. So it's not that much. 8, 10 is quite contained, it's, it's not a big deal. Uh, I will say that this really depends on space a lot. Uh, the setup in that, those cases is, is really important. So when you see 30, 40 people, probably it's because you have the whole room available for modeling, right? Then it comes to the natural cognitive uh, capacity of, of grasping something 
So then it starts to appear and emerge uh, boundaries in domain drain design. We will say the, the bounded context. And sometimes they are quite clear, sometimes they are not that much clear. But I would say that it's healthy over 15. Uh, I, I guess that 8 is sometimes too few. Uh, yeah. You don't have the whole mission, the whole views that you would like to have. So, but it's really hard to get 15 people to agree in two or three hours of working together. So it may be very interesting in those kind of summits that some companies do, like the two days going somewhere else outside the country, outside the office, sorry. Uh, sometimes it works like that. Otherwise, you need to be really good managing the logistics. And the, the facilitator is super important because you can handle this amount of people in different ways. Like doing a small groups, like 10 minutes of creating events and, and model the the whole system, and after 10 minutes, maybe put all together and check what everybody wrote, or do you have different strategies there? I, just, just to finish on the topic, I, I find out that the managing of the energy of the workshop itself, as it's a long workshop, it's quite key. And there are some natural patterns, in terms of people start very weird, and they start to get excited, and everybody is just adding stuff and a lot of chaos. And then you need a lot of energy to make a sense of it. And, and people start to divert, people need to smoke. So managing the energy is, is I think that they're really resides the talent of the facilitator. The first thing that you need to do is get rid of the chairs. <laughs> Everybody should be a standard. Because if people sit, they will fall asleep after two hours for sure. Or they will disconnect. Yeah, but they, they will need. So you need to do breaks, you need yeah. to do and in the breaks sometimes happen interesting things. The people who is more excited start to talk in small groups, and then you you usually go to here and to extract more interesting stuff. Do you try doing it over several days or over longer periods and having the the model there over so yeah. that people can come back to it and change in things? In our case, it was kind of natural that they ask us for it. We plan it like for three hours, uh, something like that. We end up doing like seven hours, but they were asking it. And if they ask it, you do it. If you see that the people start to diverge and not to, not to pay attention, well, it's time to stop. All the times that I did this was two complete working days. And yeah, but people wanted that because at the beginning we wanted one day. When we finished, they said, we need another day. And it was super useful. In fact, the second day was more useful than the first one. So the second time that we did this, we went directly to two days. And we did this always two days. Yeah. There's a lot of, uh, it's also very connected with the personalities. Like you said, it's thing of the energy. Um, some people, they are more comfortable that, okay, we finished the workshop. That there's even like a, a tip that ideally you finish the workshop slightly earlier than like the normal working hours or, or what was expected. You like, you purposefully leave some buffer by the end because people will finish but then some of them will go still back to the board and kind of read and think about and then absorb, right? It's kind of, it depends on the person, depends on the personality, which then it happens that the next day they, they have more ideas, they have more insights and it's quite interesting. A point also is to have in mind what level of detail of even storming are you applying. If it's a big picture, Mostly, what we have said about 20 people, it's uh, right. But if you are focusing more on process modeling or software design, then you are changing from the problem space to the solution space. And then you have to reach agreements. And the more people you have, the harder it will be. So the scope is reduced. And uh, later we will discuss this, but um, since the scope might is different, you might need different amount of people. Yeah, that, that, that's quite interesting. Uh, if you can identify in which moment you are, if you are in the diverging moment, uh, probably you can deal with a lot of people and you want to converge to something, is when you are transition into the solution space and, and, and yeah you you need to take decisions so things 
I also believe that a big picture, even storming, usually uh, requires um, a great bunch of hours and doing it intensively one day without breaks, well, breaks, I mean breaks between days, uh, it's not as richful as it could be. But you might have the constraint of the time, availability of people, but from my view, if you could make it uh, in two days or three, with sleep in between and new reasoning, it would be much useful and valuable. Now we are focusing on the big picture, even storming. This is more or less some of these points we have already covered. The audience, the scope is more like the whole business line. The constraint is the availability of people, room, space. And I don't know if they have doubts related with this because I know that we were speaking about this with other questions, but I don't know if something is not clear enough. We should repeat some of these points. Yeah. I guess you, you use this as an occasional tool, right? So you use this once in a, I don't know how how long or what's the period that you make this decision to, to, to make this meeting and what's really what are you looking for in this meeting what I mean by this is I understand this completely if you if you're uh, auditing a company or offering advice to a company and you really want to obtain a lot of knowledge really quick I that's it's a very good tool for this but in a consolidated company uh, like how would you use this big picture I don't know if it makes sense I think that there is one very interesting thing there is all the companies right now when talking about agility they, they try to sell you that they want to be uh, cross-functional teams and many times we find out that they are not really cross-functional because you still have a lot of dependencies around if I would be, which I'm not, but if I would be in a truly cross-functional team, I would expect to have data storming canvas permanently there and modifying it whenever you want. I, I, I would aim to go there. This is it's not used to happen. So it's yes, it's expensive. It's an expensive workshop in terms of time, in terms of energy, in terms of logistics. So yeah, main moments to do that when you kick off something in the inception phases depending on where you're working, uh, on onboarding, um, every time that you are going to plan a new feature, which is quite b big enough. I mean, if you're not a feature factory, and you are trying to plan a new product or a new service, maybe it's a moment to do that. So yeah, logistics are a problem. But in the ideal world, I will keep it permanently because we are cross-functional. If we're not cross-functional, I don't see that. I wouldn't see the point. For example, uh, I did four event stormings where I'm working now. Two of them were like legacy system modeling and two for new systems. So I will do that for, for example, in our case, we were two different companies and when we merged, we were integrating our systems. And there was a time that we were not integrating that correctly. We were like trying to fit a circle inside a square and was not working perfectly. So we decided to do an event storm, a big picture in that part to align. Also, we had a remote team, so they came from Warsaw because the other thing is in Poland. And we were doing this big picture and we learned a lot from their system and our system and how to integrate that. So that's a good, a good example, I think. And another one was uh, integrating also, but with third parties, with other companies. We agreed with them in some contracts, in some events that we knew that will happen from their software to our software and it was a new system and we wanted to model all the events and from all these events we built the, the whole system.
Right, so next topic is related to what you asked. So, uh, I think that if you are working on, the, on a project, not on a product, it's convenient to do it uh, at the beginning or until the half, three quarters, but if you are at the end of a project, it might not be the best idea. Uh, perhaps because you have too much pressure and um, you are so close to the delivery that uh, perhaps um, it's better to try to finish it. But from what I would do in that case is I know that doing a big picture event storming in a project in the late phase would bring uh, inconsistencies or misunderstandings and it will be valuable. But if you are working on a project that has a beginning and end instead of on a product that is constantly evolving, um, this is my, my view. Instead on a product, I would say at any point in time and also if the product has been changing quite a lot during a period of time, after that you can do it again to explore how things have been rearranged. I think uh, what, what I would ask there it's basically well event storm is a tool it's a technique or whatever you want to call it and and as long as you know what is this used for which we talk already either like onboarding alignment uh visualization of something that's too complex uh building something new uh, adding something extra to the system so as long as you're able to answer this question for your current situation like you you are starting a new team for example and you think that you don't have alignment the team yet about what we're going to do so then you apply event storming so i guess the um i would actually re reverse the thing to to actually focus on your current status what is the thing what is the biggest pain being that either uh, alignment being lack of visibility or whatever and then if you need to increase any of these fix any of these problems then you use a tool for it right? then you would use event storm so then it's easy to think of like oh yeah it's on the map you don't need to think about it every month or every beginning of a new feature development. It's really as needed. Yeah, I quite, quite agree with that idea of it doesn't have to be prescriptive in terms of once per month. Uh, it will never do that. Uh, I think it's truly merged from, from the beginning. Next topic. Tons of closings different colors the facilitator the facilitator a big sugar <laughs> uh, it's really important you need to have what sugar what be the smaller group group sorry the smaller group that's possible to do mm, i think that it was nine or ten people i mean what is possible to do the smaller group i would say two persons two persons yeah, yeah I agree. that's the minimum bare minimum in terms of someone who could ask someone who could answer that's the very, very minimum. Probably will not be that useful, but it's still better than not to talk. So, yeah. I mean, the still the, the technique itself as using events for for modeling, for analyzing, I think it's quite useful. Then it goes together with this all this event modeling theory that Dimitro is, is, is developing and stuff. So, well, I, I, I think that we were kind of trick at some point when we were talk about uh, class diagrams and all these static diagrams, which you kind of try to get to the structure, versus the more dynamic way of modeling, which this gives you some idea of dynamics, uh, even if it's talking about facts that happens in the past. But I think the, the model itself is still valuable. More important than the amount of people, it's actually how much these people, what's the diversity between these people? how much they can contribute with the discussion because uh, when we were doing the event storming session we thought okay it's the first time we're going to do that with the client so let's get together 
the, the developers here, let's kind of simulate how it would look like an event storming session. And then we did that in the corner of the wall in the office. And we are so kind of like mind people because we're all developers, I guess, uh, that the, the comparison between the model we did there as a fake scenario with the actual thing that we did when we had the two POs in the room or the, the system architects folks, it was so huge. Like the, the richness of the discussion that when the, we actually had the event storming compared to the one where we were just simulating, let's do a simulation, was was absurd. I guess, I guess because we were like five people, but still we were very, very too much aligned, I guess, very too like-minded. And then it was kind of not, it was a dull uh, outcome compared to the other one. It was useful, like you said, like better than, than not having a conversation at all. But like if you compare, right, the, the trial and the, the actual thing, it's different. We will say that that applies to almost everything in the business. Right? The more diversity you have, the best business you could do. So it, it's overall good idea. And in this workshop, it's really good idea. And also the diversity, not only in the roles, I mean, not only between developers, product owners, designers, and so on, also in the experience in the business, in the company or in the project or whatever. Because people with less experience will ask very interesting questions. And sometimes when you have a lot of experience or knowledge in the business, you are doing assumptions and you don't need to do assumptions. So having something to ask, super useful. It's true that the Dungeon Master is not only on the technical side. I found a lot of Dungeon Masters in the functional analysis uh, business side uh, who are also so accustomed to this. This is the way that we have been working always. This is the way how we make business and we are in the business 100 years. So there is nothing we can learn that is also happening. So it's very true when someone comes dumb and do the dumb questions it's like yeah maybe you are pointing out the obvious which we forgot already i agree with you people with questions answers in fact people who care about uh, the business and thinking different perspective because nobody knows the whole thing each of them know quite well a portion and the more diversity the better common shared understanding you will achieve have you it's a bit, of, bit stupid but have you had beer alcohol in the meetings <laughs> and, <laughs> and if so did it work or it was much worse or was it much are you looking for the palmer's peak you know that that Microsoft joke about if you have like 0 0.2 oh, alcohol yeah. in veins, you are a super developer. But if you are a bit more or a bit less, you are fucked up. That's how they did the Windows Millennium. <laughs> no, we were sharing beers after the workshop. Yeah, I think we did after. This is a Hemingway quote. I, I like quote, sorry. Uh, <laughs> he said that you need to write uh, drunk and he did sober. <laughs> so no, we I didn't was in, in, in a place where we were uh, drinking in, in there, but if we are gonna talk about cows, the more cows you have in the moment when you start with the storm, the better. Then you need to get sober at some point. There is a transition at some point in the workshop in which you get sober. You tell the story, you uh, order it, you, you find there are techniques, right? You find ways to make it to make sense of it, but get drunk at least from mindful. My mind status uh, in the moment when you start and you stop. So I'm not saying that you need to do it with whiskey or with something, but <laughs> I wouldn't say that it's totally <laughs> stupid to, to be a bit uh, happy, happy, or in some <laughs> another kind of uh, conscious like status. <laughs> I'm not talking about only alcohol, but <laughs> yeah, there yeah, is caffeine, and and sugar, and yeah, things that you can yeah. smoke. <laughs> right? It's a very drained exercise. That's for sure. Like. You're gonna get super tired. That's why you don't plan for like let's do a uh, eight hours workshop. Never, never gonna work. You always plan for like you know, no more than five hours or so. Four, I don't know. It's tiresome. So as long as they they have that in mind, I guess. Yeah, pe people get sometimes naturally excited. Some people, yeah. and then you can see them. They're really 
you know, frenetic in terms of going there and talking to, you know. Uh, yeah. So that could come with alcohol or with sugar. So <laughs> usually I use sugar, but... Uh, it's, it's true that it's, it's better not to have beer at all than to have beer for the first hour and then like cut the beer because you need to focus. That's, <laughs> that's much worse. Okay, we, we were in a very beer-friendly environment, so... After the workshop. <laughs> I'd like to add something with the main ingredients. We talked about people, but also the illusion of the unlimited modeling space and the post, the sticky notes. It's really important. We will discuss it later on the patterns and anti-patterns section, but this is the psychology that is already involved. That might constrain your results at the end. The facilitator, and the host or the people who manage the space should consider it well. Every single time that I try this workshop, every, every single time, people tend to put the, the sticky note and the next one right here. And the next one right here. So then I go, after a while I... I yeah, no, well, in a line, of course. <laughs> I, I go after a while, I try not to be very restrictive at the beginning, but at, I, I say, okay, guys, you can think big, use the space, no, doesn't matter, there could be one meter in between. If you really have a, a, a long wall, and you can use those also vertically, so you put the roll paper and, and down and down, right? three, three lanes, four lanes. Um, so they say, don't, don't worry. So I, I, I will say that the... the main message at the beginning is just don't worry, just do, just go ahead, no matter how, but uh, use the space. And also the posits are not blocked, yeah. I mean you can move them, you can remove them, so from the very beginning you must send that message as a facilitator, like you have a lot of space and you can put whatever you want because you can modify that to another part of the, of the wall or whatever you need. Really basic also, everyone everyone has one Sharpie, and a Sharpie that works. Uh, so really it's important, and I have seen that it's not always enforced. So this is task of the facilitator to make sure that everyone has the material, that you have backup material because Sharpie gets wrong, and everyone have one at least from the beginning, so they really get encouraged to participate. It's really a bad pattern when it's only two or three people who are the only ones who go to put the papers. And the others are sometimes even telling them, like, oh, write that, write this, write that. Yeah. That's an anti-pattern. Uh, I mean, it still works, but probably it's, it's not what you expect. Small facilitation tricks is like, really, literally get the sharpies and go, you want one, get the posts also, keep the posts for everyone, instead of leaving there. It could be in the corner, it could be in the center of the room. Now I, I make sure that like, I give the posts here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that transferring the power. Yeah, yeah. You transfer the power and at the same time you remove the power of some... We were talking about this at the beginning, the people who get with the computer to the place. Or people who immediately sit, even if the chair is there up, behind, and it's meant not to be for that, some people go and sit. So there I'm also trying to be explicit and to remove those behaviors and to encourage very explicitly behaviors that will help the flow. Next topic. This was for me, in my personal experience, was super easy. But I don't know if it's because we have our own product and the product thing is not so, so big that we know everybody who knows which part. So when we wanted to model, for example, the booking process, it was easy to, to know who was the developer that did things the developers that we wanted to know these things because they don't know that and the product owners, the designer who created the forms and everything. But also I read some things that was not my experience that sometimes can be hard because if they happen by or politics behind some parts of the system can be a tricky process. But I never suffered. To be honest. Working for a consulting company for example which my case still, uh, that tends to be tricky, but one of these uh, event storming sessions that uh, I facilitated was even nice that we had this person that 
I don't know how he, he learned about event storming. He learned that our team did. And then he had this huge problem he wanted to solve. And the problem was exactly the kind of problem because that you have to coordinate, I don't know how many different market segments of the company. So it, it was around 12, uh, 12 to 14 people. And at least in that case, I, I was lucky because there was a, a driver, there was this person that was interested in solving this problem. It was a tech a principal there, tech architect principal of the company. And he, he went there and made sure to invite one person from every of these segments of the company. So he had the authority, right? Like he had the, and, and he could also manage the expectations with the people uh, that were managing that those specific segments to go and say, oh, by the way, I'm gonna need this person, I'm gonna need two days of this person for this specific reason. So in this case, I didn't do any of the work, I, but I think it's good to keep in mind that someone is interested into solving a problem. You, as if you're a facilitator, it's not you necessarily the person who is actually interested into solving that problem. So as long as you make clear that that person is responsible, for whoever is solving the problem, that interest interested in the solution, is the one that should uh, invite people and organize the whole thing, uh, the whole, or well, at least the whole invitation process and alignment and get hours for people. Uh, I think that's good. Like it should not be the facilitator's responsibility. I think that politic matters. Uh, I've been in organizations where people is quite free to to participate, respected that everyone will participate, and others are highly hierarchical. So it happens at many levels the problems and the drawbacks. When the business analyst people don't want developers to go into your question at the beginning, don't go, don't want developers to be too close to the business because they are afraid. I don't know exactly what they're afraid of, but they're afraid that they will say something inappropriate or, 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 or to tell the truth about how the systems are sucks, right? <laughs> so that happens. Uh, it happens also in, in, inside the teams that junior people don't feel entitled to participate at the same level as the architect or at, at the, we, we have some funny title inside our teams, which is solution designer. So I always challenge that and I said, you, I don't want solution designers, I want problem explorers, right? Uh, I don't want to go to the solution right away. And moreover, not with one person. So politics are important. I think that you need to be pragmatic. And I, I agree a lot that sometimes you will find those sponsors who will make it happen. And, and or at least to say, you know, it's okay that these people get gathered together. Just with that, you, you already get some to some point in which you can do things and then you just issue the invitation and manage the logistics as whatever you're going to do in, in whatever organization. But first, you need to be aware of what kind of limitations, constraints you have in your way of working and who is going to even feel offended. And this really happens. Even sometimes you are surprised, but people get offended. And, and that could really make this a failure if you don't handle it. I also suppose that depending on the company or the project, if you tell somebody, hey, I will steal you two days, this person from the team, maybe they want to kill you. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it didn't happen, but I suppose that in some companies you need to ask permission for doing tests. So imagine for two days workshop. A bit of maybe topic. They don't know. <laughs> I did uh, an exercise for mobbing, five persons, programming at the same time, the manager was there. But this happens the same. Uh, and, and the manager was like, I really like the outcome, how you interact, but for me, this is a nightmare. I have five persons doing one task. This is horrible. So when you're talking about 20 persons doing one task, this is the nightmare of every manager who is accustomed to optimize a task uh, assignment, right? So then you need to do a very fine work of teaching and, and, and spreading the idea of what you want to optimize is a shared understanding. So we, we go back to the beginning of why do you do this? You do it because of the shared understanding. And this is uh, the actual thing to optimize. And the way to optimize that is to get the people together. So uh, it's, it's a hard war sometimes. Uh, I had success, some, not always, but when it was, uh, it's really interesting for what it comes next, for how the people continue working and how you start to transform the organization. So I, I will not be super optimistic that with this you're gonna do transformation, but it goes in that direction. 
I'm going to make a distinction between an external facilitator and an internal one. A company contact you because you are a facilitator and they need your service. Uh, the company itself manages the invitation process, so the facilitator um, don't have the responsibility, but he could explain to the person that contact him the people that may need to be involved. But the managing happens inside the company. On the other side, if the facilitator is inside the company uh, or the initiative emerges within the company, it Usually, ha, the, these people have some power of influence so that they could manage this invitation process. Next topic. If, you, if you're planning to, I think the, the only thing I would like to add there, if you're planning to facilitate a session, uh, the, the book from Brandolini, it's very good because it has, it's very, it, it's very focused on the facilitator. It talks about, the, of course, the, the, the rules of the game and whatnot, but also there's a lot of things, a lot of tips for facilitation, facilitating sessions. And also I would say here that as a facilitator, you need to be flexible. I mean, there are rules for the event storming session, but this reminds me to Agile or doing a scrum. It's not applying the book and follow all the rules step by step. You need to adapt to your problem, to your team, the needs, or even the personality of the things, of the things, no, of the people that, that, that is in this activity. Because maybe if you have less proactive people, you as a facilitator need to be like enforcing them more. But if they are super proactive, maybe your role is different and you need to apply different rules to calm down a bit so it's not a big chaos. So it's super important the facilitator to be flexible and have these rules, but knowing that they are tips, not rigid rules. It provides a structure and according to your outcomes or needs, you can adapt it. So, for instance, if you follow the phases that are described in the book, um, they might not fit on what you are doing and also the facilitator usually might have to balance if there's an open discussion that it's happening because people are being on the same place at the same time or just make it visible and continue so then has the facilitator has um, a great um, weight on the outcome of the session. And also super important the facilitator uh, check these infinite loops discussions to break them. Sometimes people start to discuss some part of the system and they are repeating the same and you are in the typical infinite loop, a discussion that never ends. Maybe you can apply some techniques there. Look, it's another positive, go there. <laughs> it's a trade-off because really sometimes there some facilitators are really super focused on the parking lot, right? Every time that they see some discrepancy, parking lot, which is okay, but I will say that sometimes you need to let it be and, and, and to see how the, if how healthy is the discussion at that moment. generating new things uh, probably is good especially if you are in a storm phase if you are in a moment when you want to extract knowledge those conversations who start to 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 make things appear are, are, are healthy if you are in another phase of the facilitation of, of the workshop and, and you want to make sense of it maybe you're gonna be more strict into not to divert and inside topics right and and again I think the, the your your real very important job when, when facilitating is 
to read how the people is feeling, how the people is uh, interacting, to try to create better spaces and, and to say when to stop sometimes, uh, when to follow or, or to provide uh, a, a, a good space uh, to, to, to people to, 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 at the end of the day, uh, be the ones who really create the outcome. So it's not you, right? There are discrepancy in terms of do you have to have your skin in the game when, when you facilitate or do you have to be totally external? I, I have been in both sides and, and I will say that it's not prescriptive to be one of the other, but the, it changes how it works. So you need to be conscious, you need to assume it, and if you are with the skin in the game, you need to be explicit that sometimes you are going to facilitate to bring things to, to your side and try to avoid that temptation. So it's, it's all about being transparent there. So when you say make visible, as long as it's making it visible, like you can actually use as literally visible. If people are still having discussion and then someone write events and events are still happening or something else like commands or whatever uh, uh, notation are you using there, if they're literally showing up in the wall, it's a sign that it's still flowing, the conversation is still uh, fine. Yeah. Next topic. Well, in my case, what I do is, according to the expected out outcomes of the big picture of the storming, I go through all the possible notation and I make a, a summary of the notation and the material in order to show them in the legend incrementally and also uh, apart from these sticky notes that represent the notation in the legend uh, we need the paper roll if the wall don't stick or if you don't have the possibility to maintain the model you did it's um, handy to roll paper roll and get it with you somewhere else or work on it another day also some label tape to label uh, subdomains or <coughs> processes in the, in the flow and the markers sticky arcos because sometimes you need to reference from one event to different parts of the system and you are not going to paint in the wall or in the roll paper a lot of lines, so you can use uh, arrows with different colors or numbers, so you know that these arrows point into this part of the system, things like that. The more catastrophic one in my experience is when you don't stick properly the paper roll. Uh, that could be really <laughs> catastrophic because it, it, it gained weight the, with, with all the, the stickies. At some point, that could collapse and it have collapsed and it will collapse if you will not really take care of that. <laughs> 